Magandang gabi po sa inyong lahat. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Ikinagagalak namin na nandito kayong lahat ngayong gabi. We are pleased that you're here tonight. That's all <laughs> that he can say. <laughs> yeah, it is. My wife makes fun of me if I start trying to speak Tagalog. Yeah. <laughs> so he will talk and then after he's done, question and answer, I can join him again. Thank you, babe. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Celeste and I uh, wanted to be, a, we, we're, first of all, thank you very much. We're very blessed to be up here talking about this. Uh, as Mark had mentioned earlier, so December of this last year, Palawan, the island where Celeste is from, again, as Mark had indicated, which had heretofore been pretty isolated in term, and protected in terms of typhoons. Uh, it's, it was just in a very sweet spot, a very nice place to be, and all of the typhoons in the Philippines, when they, when they would come in, generally they'd come in from the southeast and go to the northeast, or south, southeast to the northwest, and it completely bypasses Palawan. Uh, you'll see on a map here very shortly that that wasn't the case this time. So, as all of us from the Midwest, when we have a tornado, does anybody ever go out and look out the window. Yeah, it's, let's go barbecue. You know, it's, we're from the Midwest. And it's kind of the same deal, and there's a false sense of security. Well, it was truly a false sense of security in this last go-round. And you'll see uh, exactly the devastation that we're talking about. So up here you see, this is Philippines, and the southwesternmost long skinny island, that's Palawan, and that's where Celeste is from. And again, you'll see here momentarily that the epicenter and the most significant amount of damage hovered directly over Palau and it covered the entire island. And not only did it cover the entire island, it sat directly over the province, the Puerto Princesa rural provinces where Celeste's family is from. So there was very immediate impact uh, that, that we heard about, we felt, and we learned. So just a little bit about Palawan. It is the single most beautiful island in the world. That's not just my word. That's from travel and leisure, Condé Nast, the works. And it's breathtaking. The photo that you're seeing there is actually us flying in over the northern islands, flying into Palawan. So Palawan itself is, uh, consists of 1,100 islands. So even though we call it one island, it's actually there are many, many smaller islands. And that's what we're flying over right there. Just absolutely majestic. It's breathtaking. It's truly paradise. You can see from some, from some of these pictures here as well. Again, this is the northern area, El Nido, uh, from the air. The bottom left is as we're coming into Puerto Princesa. Waters are crystal clear. You can see forever. And then uh, actually that beach right there, that's right next to that is a group of mausoleums, believe it or not. So um, I guess if I'm going to be buried, that would be a good place to be. Again, more breathtaking scenery. This is from El Nido, which is the northernmost parts. And, and again, words don't do it justice. They really don't. You've got these sheer cliffs that rise up out of the ocean. Um, anybody ever hear of bird's nest soup? It's a thing. Bird's nest soup is made from the saliva of these birds that live up in those cliffs. The bird's nest itself is worth more in its weight than gold. People will literally climb up to the top of that cliff to harvest that. Very life-threatening, um, but certainly worthwhile, clearly. The boats you see up there are very typical of the boats that you see in the Philippines. They're called pump boats, and basically they're outriggers. And that's the main form of transportation in and around the different islands. Magnificent history. The pictures you see here, the top left is uh, Fort Isabel. Isabella, and that is in a city, a region called Tai Tai. Tai Tai was the first provincial capital of Palawan, and it was founded in the early 1600s. That's the earliest church in, in Palawan. To the right, what you see is representative of, of traditional Filipino architecture, and there's a whole story behind that building, so keep that in mind. Magnificent. That was built actually by a local artist from the refuse of the typhoon. So God can take anything and turn it to his good. And that was just a magnificent piece of uh, real estate. 
friendliest smiles and faces that you'll ever see anywhere in the world. To the left, uh, you'll see more of that. That, is, uh, that lady is Sydney, Sydney Francisco. And not to, uh, literally she was, to borrow the term from Robinson Crusoe, she was our Girl Friday. She was our hands and feet. She made things happen. She was the maker of things that happened. My uh, minion, and you'll see more of her, uh, she tended to pop up whenever we were in the village. And then, uh, I don't know who those ones are on the right, but uh, that's a, that's a fine looking lady. Some of the fine transportation that you'll see typically in the Philippines to the top left is kind of iconic of the Philippines. That's called a uh, jeepney for obvious reasons. Those are typically built after World War II from US surplus military stuff that like the Filipinos do with so many things, they make it their own, they make it better, and that's what they did. So that's really iconic. Uh, some of the other transportation, maybe not so iconic, but to me, if I were to take a snapshot of the rural Philippines, that's it on the right. The stories that that old man could probably tell you with his machete riding his Carabao oxen, um, on the highway, mind you, that's on the highway. The one in the bottom center, that's us in literally the boondocks. Boondocks is a Filipino word. It means you're up in the hills. So that is a, I don't know what that is, it's tricycle, kind of a tricycle. It's a motorcycle with uh, basically a carriage on the side of it, kind of a sidecar. Yeah, okay. And then that's just uh, pretty typical of the normal traffic that you see. It's, it's a little hard to see in that picture, but that in the bottom left, that blue thing, that's a tricycle. That's kind of the common way of getting around. And it's a motorcycle with, an, with a, basically a covered sidecar. Uh, actually a very unique and fun way to get around. So about Typhoon Odette, what happened? Well, as you can see, here's some statistics up here. 10.8 million affected across 11 regions, 10,100 barangays. A barangay is a village, so not all, the, not all of that is directly in Palawan, but the, the impact of Palawan was ex extremely significant. There were around 400 and over 400 deaths, and this is from UN statistics, so it may have changed as they, as they got more numbers in. Displaced three million people, two million homes uh, were damaged, 427,000 were totaled. When I say totaled, I don't mean like the roof had collapsed. It was gone, washed out to sea, no longer existed, couldn't be found. That's what I mean when I say totaled. 10 million hectares, that's 25 million acres, or about half the state of Kansas was impacted of, uh, of the crop area. 120,000 livestock and poultry were lost, and, and damages to fisheries were about two, 2 billion Filipino pesos. So very significant. Now bear in mind, Sydney, who was our hands and feet over there, Sydney had a good job. Sydney worked for the government. She actually uh, gave, she worked for the Department of uh, Health. She admitted, she gave hygiene, she gave uh, COVID shots. Okay, well, just an assistant, but she had a full-time job working for the Department of Health at the government offices. I believe she made $100 a week? A month. A month. So that was her living, $100 a month. So a lot of the Filipinos augment their incomes doing all kinds of things. They're very enterprising people. A lot of it is fishing, a lot of it is farming. They're enterprising people. You do what you have to do to make ends meet. So this is, uh, in a snapshot, in the top left, that's all of the Philippines. And you can see how this, uh, how uh, the, the trajectory of the, uh, of the typhoon. The center is specifically Palawan. And the far right, in the round circle, that is the area that was most significantly impacted. And in that area, uh, you'll see here in a moment, but those are specifically the provinces of Puerto Princesa. And those were the areas that were most impacted. And you'll see some photos here in just a moment of that. If you look at the, if, at the left picture, Believe it or not, that was a brand spanking new ecotourism resort founded about 10 years ago. In fact, the last time Celeste and I were in the Philippines together before this trip, Celeste has been back a few times. 
But when we were together, that was brand spanking new. An ecotourism resort on the Mayoon River, uh, longest river on, uh, on Palawan, and it was, it was magnificent. Across the river, and it's a little bit hard to see, but you can kind of see the pink through the trees, that is basically land, uh, landslide damage. And, you know, the, the two pictures on the right, those are just very representative of the damage you could see without, you know, turning your head. Everywhere you looked, it was like that. The top left is a school. Uh, believe it or not, they're back in doing school in, in that building now. They got a new roof on there. The top right, again, more landslide damage, and you can see and to the left and, and the bottom right, again, just more typical damage that you see. These places are just absolutely leveled. This one is a little bit hard to see. So the two pictures, there's two pictures on the left. Both of those are churches. The one in the top frame actually is not doing too bad because they've got part of their roof built. And uh, we were, you know, you know, thankfully, we were able to help them get that done. But that's only half of it. So that covers our sanctuary, and that's, if you're lucky, if you come early, you can sit in the shade. They're still working on it. Um, the bottom one, same kind of deal, different church, and you can see it's brand new roof paneling. They've still got more to do, but the same deal. If you're lucky, you get there early, you get to sit in the shade while the sermon's happening. This picture, it's another view of the Mayan River, and if you look between the... Uh, railing on the, uh, that's a bridge going over the highway, you can see some stairs going down into the river. Can you see that? The last time we were over there, there was a landing, and there was a, a very enterprising business. They would do, uh, it was basically like a very large pontoon boat, and they would go, they did river excursions up and down the river. Well, because of the damage of the typhoon, because the river is congested, and because the people lost their boat in all likelihood, they don't do that anymore. So, I mean, it was a very lucrative business and they lost everything. And right now, the river's not even navigable. And then, uh, actually, this picture on the left, that's very uh, close to Celeste's father's village. It looks normal enough. It looks a little bit like it's overgrown. I think everybody can kind of see that. What you don't see is that the houses that are sitting there are not the houses that were there before the typhoon. Those are the houses that came down the hill and landed there and are now being overgrown. What you don't see are the houses that were sitting there that got washed down into the river. So none of that is uh, habitable, quite frankly. The bottom right, again, just another view of the river. Cleared up a little bit. It's actually a nice, beautiful, clear river in, on on most occasions. A uh, lot of debris still kind of filtering in there, so it muddies it up quite a bit. Across there, uh, that's actually a coconut plantation. Two thirds of the crop is gone. The top right, and I told you I, I would have something inspirational, and there's something inspirational from this. In Palawan, they're very conscious of the environment. I mean, that's what put them on the map, pretty much. It's, it's an ecotourism uh, destination. As such, they take, uh, basically, logging. You have to have a very special permit to do logging. If you don't have the permit, it's considered the same as poaching endangered species. So the logs that you see on this top right picture here, that's mahogany and nara, uh, very expensive uh, tropical hardwoods, exotic hardwoods. Well, the blessing is this. All of that stuff from the landslides got washed out to the ocean, washed back up on the beach. Once it's on the beach, guess what? It's public domain. Anybody can have that. So the people, the enterprising people, and I've got another picture somewhere else I could share with you. Uh, enterprising people with chainsaws went in and basically they had a pretty crude milling operation. But the, the, the hut I showed you earlier was built by a local artist from the stuff that washed back up onto the beach. So there is a blessing in, in all of this, ultimately. So what did we do? Very early on, very early on, uh, Celeste, 
started gathering, uh, you know, because she was getting reports in for, from her family. You know, initially it was, there was no communication. Everything was down. And even on a good day, sometimes everything's down. But especially then, on the, on the aftermath of the, of the typhoon, uh, you know, I'll share with you, my wife was quite anxious. So the reports started trickling in. Well, Celeste and her network, I mean, she immediately started fundraising and, and we were able to uh, start shipping over packages beginning in, in uh, January. Going by boat takes a little while. So they started shipping out in January. We started collecting in December, started shipping those in January. Uh, this bottom left picture, you can't really see him too well, that fine looking guy in the red t-shirt, that's our friend Danny. Danny owns a uh, freight forwarding company. So uh, he was able to uh, get us in there pretty darn quick. So uh, we were shipping out one, two boxes a month and uh, a big thanks and, and shout out to the missions team for helping subsidize that because that was able, we were able to get this stuff into uh, the hands of the people that needed it most pretty darn quick. As you can see, so those are some of the earlier distributions. Just some of the many families that were uh, beneficiaries of this stuff, and, and my wife is quite the creative rapper, so um, just because it says weighted blanket, it was probably Tupperware, who knows what it was. But uh, anything that the people needed, you know, we were trying to get sent out. Um, a lot of times, you know, these folks lost everything. So a lot of times it was as simple as, as you know, Tupperware containers so that they could keep their food at least uh, sanitary and fresh. Uh, it may have been tools, you know, so that they could make some basic repairs. The things we take for granted over here, you can't walk down to your Home Depot and buy a reciprocating saw, or even if you could, you know, could you power it? You know, it's, we take a lot for granted over here. So who's Annabelle? I thank the Lord for Annabelle. Annabelle had a vehicle and she was able to get a lot of the most needed goods to the most needed people in the most remote places. Early on, one of the things that we did was we helped fund because again, something we take for granted quite often, footwear. Absolutely. in January to send help, um, uh, I asked some of the Filipinos here, and then what I gathered from the teachers, most of them are my cousins, the kids go to school without flip-flops, like they are just walking barefooted. Everything is gone, like from their houses, of course, and the only thing left is the clothes, the clothes they wear. I mean, it's gone. So what they ask for that are flip-flops for schools. So we were able to, oh, okay. So Mr. Pengman, <laughs> so he asked me about the typhoon and I showed him pictures of houses. And then I think he was the one that brought it up to from the missions team. Yeah. And they gave us $2,000 to help. And so from the first time I sent uh, flip-flops, then it was al already came from that. So I was able to like send to more or less 10 elementary schools, like it's either 500 pairs of flip-flops, 400, 300, it depends on how many elementary pupils are there. And they are very, very thankful for those um, efforts. So that's how we started it. And then my, my cousin, I have a cousin whom I trust. Her name is Annabelle. I sent money to Annabelle and Annabelle would buy those flip-flops from the stores that will sell it in a low price. So that's why she was able to like save uh, money for that. That's why we were able to give most of the schools. But then when we were airborne, I think we were already in the Philippine area. Oh, Chida doesn't want me. No, no, no. Okay. No. So 
I'll let Celeste continue on with that thought, but okay. um, yeah, continue on. Uh, okay. So, uh, so Annabelle, so Annabelle is my cousin. She's the one I trusted. She's my special power of attorney. And then when we were airborne, like landing on the Philippine soil, when the plane landed, so all the messages came in through my cell phone, and everybody close to me said she's gone. She had a motorcycle accident. So we were talking, when we were, I was still here, that we are going to meet, we, are, we have lots of things to do. She, because she started to help me, through her, I was able to help others. But then when she passed, I was kind of like, what do I do now? So, uh, untimely death. I mean, she was just riding a motorcycle. She's in a hurry because a Catholic church has a program that evening, 6 p.m., and he, she, she had an accident at 3 p.m., bringing all the costumes of her dancers for that particular program. So it was really devastated, devastating. So then that's why when I plan, what's the name of, one of the couple here, the Filipino couple, they sent me $200 and they told me, like instead of buying flip-flops or other material things, we'll just like do some, a little party, like, you know, uh, feeding them or something like that. And so it was supposed to be at Annabelle's village. Most of my family is there. But when I lost Annabelle, I don't know what to do. So I went back to the village where I grew up, like where my mom taught in high school. She's a retired teacher, that village there. And we were able to buy two pigs. So two pigs was, were able to feed 300 plus people. And they are very thankful, and I thank you, the couple, Emily, and forget the name, Ken. And then another Filipino friend also added to that. So I just want to, I mean, little things for them, they will not forget. But when we were having a party like this, all of them are Catholics. So, so we were, we put that, like Crossroad Christian Church, we have the, what did, is that that we printed? Why don't you come up here and we'll, we'll talk through it. Uh, I've got <laughs> slides on all this stuff. Uh, you do? Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no, it's, so sadly, you know, it was heartbreaking. It was absolutely heartbreaking. The last text we got leaving U.S. soil was from Annabelle saying, hey, we can't wait to see you guys. And as Celeste had indicated, the first text, you know, our phones are blowing up as we land that, you know, Annabelle had passed. So, actually, that was our first stop when we went from Manila to Puerto Princesa. We stopped at the funeral home. They were having a 24-hour vigil, and, and we were able to see her at that time. Uh, the top left, or the t yeah, the top left is a very, very small slice of the funeral procession, which went for miles. Annabelle touched a lot of hearts, and it was, it was surely a, a significant loss. So uh, the first thing we had to do was fill some big shoes. So thankfully, we were able to do that. Uh, her uh, cousin Rika was, uh, introduced us. So Rika and Ness, uh, Kat Bagan, you'll see the uh, very center there, introduced us to Joey Malaluan who was the, head, the senior pastor at the JIL, or Jesus is Lord Church, in Puerto Princesa. And uh, at any rate, uh, Joey got us plugged in. Rika uh, was a volunteer coordinator, and uh, Ellen was uh, actually kind of the executive administrator. She is actually now Celeste Power of Attorney in the Philippines, so she's got a lot of connections, a lot of reach. Uh, Renee. Uh, I call him cultural attaché, and I don't think that's actually a far reach. It is what he did professionally. He was the director of tourism for the province of uh, Palawan, and uh, he had a lot of connections and, and was able to uh, knock, knock down a few doors for us. And then Sydney, maker of things that happened. Sydney was magnificent. Uh, also, some other 
significant influencers that we couldn't have done any of this without. The Fiesta uh, MC was the first lady of the uh, Barangay My Own. Um, none of this could have happened without her blessing. So uh, as Celeste was mentioning, towards the end, we had a Fiesta. The Fiesta happened in the town square. Again, that had to be coordinated through the civil authorities, and that was, in this case, her and her husband. So we thank them for that. Uh, the Philippine congressman and ex-mayor of Puerto Princesa, Edward Hagedorn, was, uh, was also just a remarkable and wonderful resource. He helped uh, knock down a few doors for us as well. The Spano family, they shuttled us all over. So the picture of us back in the uh, boondocks, if you will, on that green creation of a, of a vehicle was his. So uh, yeah, very adventurous people. And then Celeste, you want to talk about this? Uh, Celeste and her posse on a shopping expedition here. So this is similar to the this, this store, I would call it, similar to like a Costco, something along those lines, where we could go in, we could buy in bulk. Uh, so we did. And that's... It took half day before they finished computing what we bought. Honestly, like, I think he was just, I think he was just, um, how do you say it, polite, but actually probably is already like, what's going on? Why are you Filipinos are like this? I think that's already his thinking. But we went back and forth and forth and back, talking to sales girls, talking to those, doing the wholesale and everything. I don't know what's wrong. They cannot figure out how much do we need to pay. It took like hours, honestly. Right, honey, babe? Oh, yeah, I did. Yeah. <laughs> so, and so, so we were able, to, we, we left the store, we had a little snack, and then we went back, but actually I raised my voice a little bit to the sales lady, and then my cousin said, and then when we left, I said, oh my God, yeah. I need to say sorry, but then, then he asked my cousin if that's me really like that. And then my cousin said, yeah, it's her natural. Oh my God. <laughs> Things we learned. So, so we went back to the store. I went directly to the sales lady and I said, sorry. Um, I'm kind of like, it's, uh, who, will, who will not feel that way? I mean, you will just add like 10 pesos, 100 pesos, 1,000 pesos equals. But then I don't know what's going on. So these pictures were the ones that they distributed. They wanted um, hygiene, hygiene kits because those people that uh, gave them already what they needed, they didn't include hygiene, hygiene kits. So those are the things we bought. And we were able to, I think, 400 families and then the middle ones those are for my party so I gave away some gifts to them so that you know they and now you know what's the problem now other villages are now waiting for me so they want me to go to the village next year and do the party there and give away so Mr. Fangman maybe again <laughs> And so, I think that's it. I think that's it. Yeah. So, yeah, the, uh, the very far right picture that you see over there is them taking the bulk items that we purchased, like, you know, thousands of toothbrushes and breaking those down, packaging them. A tremendous amount of work. And all of those were from the JIL Church. So we really, uh, really appreciate all their help in, in that endeavor. And that was one trip to the store, by the way. There were, there were several others. So the primary needs, uh, so from the financial contributions, we're able to do things like help them reconstruct this hut, hut house, um, and basically, just so you understand, the bottom right, that is very typical of a provincial house. Yeah. Okay. I want to talk about that bottom picture. So that's Sydney and the husband. And after they gave... You gave us the 2000 I was able to help Sydney with the roof. So that roof, 35, um, 
sheets. pieces, sheets, 35 sheets of tin roof. So they were able to put that on their house because their house were like, the cement's still there, but then their roofs is gone. So according to Sydney, they sleep, they don't have a bed. They sleep on a cement floor and they see the stars every night. That's how they sleep. So when we gave us that roof, she said, she's like this, you know, well, Filipinos, oh my God, you know what? Atisel, ate means older sister. You know what, Atisel, until I die, I will not forget you, something like that. And I was kind of like, and she kept on repeating that and repeating that. So she's, she's actually already my friend, but she's a friend that you can ask a favor. Like, so I talked to her. I said, when I go to the Philippines, you need to stay with me. And she didn't tell me that she works for the government. She didn't ask permission. So now I needed to talk to the, to her boss. Who does that? And I said, why you didn't tell me you were working for the government? She said, well, if I tell you, you will not like, you know, bring me with you wherever you go. So I, I talked to the boss for like 30 minutes to explain. So that's the husband. They don't have kids, but now they're happy. They, are, they have a roof now. So they can, although they don't, they don't still have the bed, but I think that's not part of the thing anymore. So that's, thank you very much, Crossroads, for the roof of that. Um, I didn't hesitate to help her because ever since I knew she's a good person. She's honest. My mom likes her too. You didn't hear anything like she's a scammer or she's a liar or like that. So it's from the bottom of my heart. And now when the neighbors and all the villagers from my mom's area heard about it, they want all of them to have the 35, uh, 35 sheets of thin roofs. Mr. Fangman. So, right, and uh, actually we were able to supply several throughout that village, so buying in volume is uh, truly a blessing. Additionally, um, we were able to do things like this. So as I'd already mentioned, one of the primary forms of livelihood being an island nation is on the water. So uh, we were able to help some folks you know, with plywood, things like this, and, and they could uh, get their livelihood back up and going, building their fishing boats, reconstructing their fishing boats. Now this is when we were actually doing our, uh, our hygiene kit distribution. So this was our jumping off point, which is uh, the Jesus is Lord Church, and that's about as fancy as most of those churches are. Um, that one actually did surprisingly well. Uh, they retained the roof, as you can see, it's uh, still there. Uh, pretty basic, pretty fundamental. They did lose a, a section of their roof and we were able to help them get that back up. We started off, uh, then we went over to Lakbuan. Uh, as you see in the bottom left, that is what they call a multi-cab which uh, there's another picture of me somewhere in there and it would give you an idea of the scale of those things, but suffice to say, two of me couldn't fit in the back of that side by side. I mean, uh, they're just minuscule. But that was our transportation back into the, that was our transportation back into the uh, rural areas to do this uh, distribution. So this first church was, uh, was, that's actually our second stop of the day. Uh, the next place we went, Babuyan, uh, there was not a church represented in that community at all. There was no church. So uh, thankfully, we were able to connect with the barangay captain, which is the gentleman in the red t-shirt that you see there. Uh, so he was able to help with distribution to the families in need in that community. Um, that was rather typical of the travel that day. Uh, we went uh, into some pretty remote areas. And ironically, the nicest church of all of them that we visited that day didn't have a road to it. We had to drive through the river to get there. Now the problem with that church, they did amazingly well uh, because of the, they really hadn't done too much. They, they laid the concrete slab. They were just building the church when the typhoon happened. So they really didn't lose a lot. Uh, in fact, they were able to, I mean, it's pretty much a brand new church. Their issue is the fact that the river was so far rerouted that it is now one foot outside their back door. So the danger is the church is going to fall into the river now. Fiesta Barangay Mariugan. 
talk to us about this, Celeste, and, and you guys are in danger now. Celeste was really in her element at this as the master of ceremonies. But no, so this is, this is it, the 300 plus people that came. So we used the banana husk. Instead of plastic, we put all the food in the banana husk. They cut it. So these are all volunteer work. I was, I was only the one that paid for the pigs. But then they kill the pigs, they cook, they, they arrange this and everything. We just went there. So um, volunteer work is not a problem there. But the prob it's not a problem. But you know what? All of those, they are all Catholics. So I went with them to the church. With them, I know all of them. So when we started talking about Crossroad Christian Church, how is it? And then he had a speech. Of course, I needed to, he said, I need to interpret it in Filipino language. I don't know, but I added more. And then I told them that the only way to God a Father is through Jesus. I just want them to, like, I don't want them to feel like I'm encouraging them not to be a Catholic anymore or something. But I just want to tell them that the only way to the Father is through Jesus. What I meant is, you don't need to go to saints. You don't need to you know, pray to Mother Mary or whoever. It's just direct, Jesus direct to the Father or something like that. They were listening to me, and then I don't know what they were thinking, but then after I talked, they clapped. So I, I think they got it. So I don't, <laughs> I don't know. But... They, it's probably awkward. Actually, it's awkward for me because all of them, I go, I went with them to Catholic churches, to Catholic church. It is right, just right there. And I want to add, but this is, uh, this is really a good idea of the couple, the Filipino couple, because in one day, these kids and these people really were happy that day. They were happy. They were happy eating. They were happy receiving gifts. And then we had games. They were happy playing games to earn the, you know. So something like that. And what I heard, it, what I heard, that's, that's why you see all the Christian churches there. It, it looks like that. Still no help. Because probably Philippines is majority Catholics. So the help, I think, only goes to Catholics. Because my cousin told me once that when the help came, the priest even said that they're not even Catholics, meaning the help should go only to the Catholics or something like that. So it's kind of like, well, I was hurt because before probably if I was still a Catholic, it's fine with me, but you know. So that's why I, I wanted to tell them that Whoever comes, uh, Catholics or not, or we need to help. So the help goes to Catholic churches. That's why Christian churches really need help. And one of the lady, a leader there in one of the churches said, Oh my goodness, we are praying for, for a help. And we didn't know you are just from us, meaning because I just came from that area and my mom was their teacher in high school. So they were happy like, oh my God, we were praying and it's just you that, so I don't know, maybe they are thinking I'm going to send them something, but Mr. Fangman. So Celeste is stealing all the thunder here. <clears throat> so what you don't see is behind us, if you're looking at the picture on the right, uh, directly, uh, in front of that, past the palm trees, that's, that's the elementary school, and it's a relatively new one. Behind us, what you don't see is that that's the Catholic Church. What you also don't see, and you can kind of see it in the picture on the left, there was, we were very blessed with weather. I mean, it's the rainy season when we we're in the Philippines, but it didn't rain. Maybe a few hours here and there. It was the most torrential downpour you could imagine. We had a captive audience. So while there was a feast going on next door, literally, right behind us in the Catholic Church, we had a captive audience all day long. And I'm sure the, the parish priest was kind of like, 
looking at his clock. So yeah, it was, it was awesome. We were able to reach a lot of people that day. So this is just some of the activities. As you can see, Celeste is in her element. Uh, we had giveaways, uh, for instance, mostly like kitchenware, uh, electric fans. It's amazing. Uh, air conditioning is a real luxury over there. Most people don't have it. An electric fan is, is a real treat, and quite frankly, a necessity when the temperature is hovering around 90 degrees plus, uh, twice the humidity of what we have here. I mean, it's, it can be pretty miserable. Uh, shoes, clothes, tools, especially were uh, hand tools were uh, greatly appreciated. And of course, there was a lot of dancing and fun. Um, the neatest one, and unfortunately it doesn't turn out in this picture really well, the ladies in the red and white dresses were doing a traditional Filipino candle dance, which is really a really a neat, neat thing to see. But uh, it, it was a great time, and, and again, uh, Ken and Emily helped, uh, helped fund that, um, and uh, lechon roast pig is like the big treat of any type of thing like that, so uh, it, was, it was really nice that we were able to provide that for the people. And then, just as Celeste said, we were able to share the Romans Road message with these people, and it was very well received, quite frankly. Um, and I think it was well received because that one right there did such an outstanding job translating, but it's a, it's a relatively simple message, and it was one that was very, very well received. And the thing about this, just as Celeste had indicated, it, it talks about the direct relationship between you and God. And that's something that's very alien to a lot of the Filipino people that always need an intermediary intercessor in the form of the Catholic Church. So a lot of people were kind of looking at us, kind of thinking, eh, I don't know about this, you know. Um, but by the time we were finished, I think we had a lot of indirect converts. I really do. It was, it was really a blessing. So I think that's it. Um, the timeline, I'll just go through that really quick because I know, uh, I know we're getting late. Early on, December is when we kind of started the efforts. Rolling through that, we gathered momentum. Where we're at right now is Celeste and I are going to continue to maintain this. Uh, we were very blessed. And I don't want to indicate anything other than what it is. I wanted to give thanks to Crossroads because they were very supportive of this entire uh, initiative. So um, I wanted to acknowledge Crossroads. And in so doing, we established the Crossroads Christian Outreach Center. And that's not to say it's in any way to, uh, officially uh, connected to Crossroads Christian Church. And, but I didn't want it to go and said that Crossroads wasn't fundamental in helping us get this stuff done. So we're going to continue on with that. Uh, some of the other names that you can't see up there um, from the church directly, uh, Ken and Emily Ballone. Uh, and uh, other than that, it was a lot of uh, Celeste's uh, Filipino people over here, uh, Philippe Francisco, uh, Peter and Bing Sekash, Aurora Pisano. Um, many of you have already prayed for her for other things. Danny and Jeanette Gallos, who uh, helped with logistics and shipping. So, uh, I guess more than anything else, thank you. Thank you very much, Crossroads, because I know a lot of you prayed, a lot of you contributed. We couldn't have done any of it without you, and I think it was, uh, I think it was very well appreciated by the people of the Philippines. Yes. Do you see my husband? He's more Filipino than me. This is our national costume, and me, being a Filipino, I didn't wear one. Well, anyways, so from the bottom of my heart, Thank you very much to all of you. Crossroads, Mr. Pengman, and thank you, Mr. Brad Fogo. You voted yes to give uh, support to, yeah, right? You told me that. Mr. Mark Palmer, Palmer, and everybody, I don't know whom to mention, but thank you, thank you, thank you. And who wants to come with us next time to the Philippines? Ah, ha, ha, yay! <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> I know we're getting late, folks, so I uh, wanted to leave a few minutes for question and answer. No question. You already did. Uh, yeah. 80%. 80% and 20% is a mix of like us and Muslims and Muslim in the southern part of the Philippines. They are huge there. But yeah, like, I don't know, but the feeling like 
before when I used to be a Catholic, when I see non-Catholic coming to our area, it's kind of like awkward for me. It's kind of like, why are you here? We are Catholic, something like that. Now it's uh, the other way around, I feel. Like, I'm honestly, for my how many years of existence, when I came here to Crossroads, that's when I had a special relationship with God. So I'll stay here. Good question. Um, what, it, what is happening, though, and there is, uh, there is growth in a couple different areas. There is some growth in the Protestant area, uh, and whether it's denominational or non-denominational, um, you know, I, there was a lot of representation of all kinds of different churches. Baptist, Methodist seem to be two of the largest um, non-denominational Bible-based churches. That's why we went with JIL. That's what that is. It's, it's a Bible-based church. Um, Ironically, it's also a missionary outreach church, and this, this is an interesting story, and I'll, I'll get to it very briefly, but the people in the Philippines see the people in the United States as an unreached group. The people of the Philippines send missionaries to the United States. Think about that for a minute. The people of the Philippines have a unique office over there, and it's called the Office of Foreign Workers. No, I don't know about that. The one that places people abroad for work? Is that from Rika? Rika told you this story? So, anyway, the OFW, the Office of Foreign Workers, is, a, is, a, is an official government office, the purpose of which is to get people, Filipino people, work abroad. And as we all understand, the purpose of that is so that they can make money and send it back to the Philippines. The interesting thing about that is that a lot of proselytizing can happen through this group because they're going into places that a lot of uh, traditional missionaries can't, places like Bahrain, places like Saudi Arabia. So, I mean, they're very active in the missions group as well. Sorry, I didn't understand, but yeah, that's it. Yeah. Anyways, my husband is ready. He knew more about the Philippines than me, I guess. Like, <laughs> maybe he researched. A lot. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.